So welcome everybody um, to our Annie Research Working Group seminar. And um, on this date, we will hear from Daniel Smith, soon to be Dr. Daniel Smith, who is um, was a doctoral student at Emory University, and I was on his committee and just really excited that he'll be presenting his research work that he did for his dissertation um, and, and any other news that you want to share, but we're delighted to have you here and I am going to turn it over to you, Daniel. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, just before we get started, my screen's still sharing, right? Perfect. Um, so today I will give um, just a brief talk about what my dissertation work did entail. It's really nice to see everyone's faces. Um, thank you all for joining me today. As we get started, there are a couple of terms that I would like to define first. First, we have chronic kidney disease. And chronic kidney disease is what we typically think about whenever someone says, I have kidney disease. It is that gradual loss of kidney functioning that results over time due to typically hypertension, diabetes, um, repeated exposure to nephrotoxins, um, and there are a couple other risk factors on the list. Then we have chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology, which is a new type of kidney disease that is thought to be primarily caused due to occupational heat stress and repeated dehydration at work. It is also one of the first chronic diseases that is said to be a direct result of climate change. We then have within both a kind of these both chronic kidney disease worlds, we have acute kidney injury, which is a sudden loss of kidney functioning. Traditionally, it's associated with hospitalized patients and the loss that happens whenever persons are in the hospital and they're dehydrated from being in the hospital. However, the literature has shown that you can have acute kidney injury at work, and we'll talk about some of that literature as part of this presentation. We then have heat related illness, which is a continuum of symptoms that range from very mild to from nausea, vomiting, um, to a loss of sweating, all the way to more of those severe symptoms, which are heat stroke and death. And then there's finally heat strain, which kind of falls under heat related illness. And it's the strain that heat puts on the body and both environmental heat and then physiological or metabolic heat stress from how hard a person is working. Next, I will go into the background, more of the, the general background of all of this work. So our society, the functioning depends on the power differentials that maintain the need for migrant workers. There are many examples of this, including the years in the past in which there have not been enough migrant workers and crops have rotted in the fields when native born workers refuse to work in the conditions that many of our migrant workers are subjected to. Um, the occupational environment that farm workers work in is not only made worse by climate change, but it's particularly made worse by increasing global temperatures. And given that the last five years have been the hottest on record, we really are starting to recognize the impact that working in the heat, not only in the heat, but working hard in the heat can have on the body. One example, again, as I said, is CKDU. And the most of the literature of CKDU comes from Central America, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador. Um, and persons develop their kidney disease in the absence of traditional risk factors. I didn't highlight that on the last slide, but it's really important that these workers develop chronic kidney disease in the absence of hypertension or diabetes. Um, and primarily it has been seen in young men, particularly sugarcane workers in Central America. However, there are more there's more evidence now that workers in the United States can suffer from CKDU, particularly that acute kidney injury piece that's tied into being dehydrated at work. Um, and that's kind of the, the basis of this dissertation and this body of work was I kind of wanted to know was there evidence for the disease in the United States? And that is the question that led to the literature review that makes up the first paper of my dissertation. So we have heat stress and kidney function in farm workers in the US, a scoping review. Um, this review was done as part of my dissertation and has been published in the Journal of Agri-Medicine. We decided to use a scoping review methodology because it allowed us to include a broader range of evidence. We knew of one book particularly that had been published on the topic that we wanted to make sure was included. And we just knew that with this area of research being such a 
a, a new area of research and the literature only dates back to like 2010 is when one of the first publications in Central America came out. We knew that the scoping review would really allow us to have a more broader question that might capture the work we were looking for. Um, and we did do a systematic scoping review, not to be confused with a systematic review, but we systematically searched MBASE, CNAHL, PubMed, and Web of Science. These were our results. We started out with 228 articles and we whittled our way down to four included piece of pieces of literature, um, three traditional academic publications, and then one ethnography. First, I will walk us through the three academic pieces of literature that were included, not to say that the ethnography is an academic, but our traditional journal articles. And of the of these, they were three qualitative, there were three quantitative articles, um, and it was by Mix, Moist, and then another Moist article. So those were the three. Um, of these three quantitative studies, varying assessments of heat strain were conducted. For example, in the work by the Mix and her team, they utilized a calculated heat index in order to study the relationship between environmental heat strain and acute kidney injury. In their study of Florida farm workers, approximately a third of all of the participants experienced acute kidney injury on at least one day out of the three days of the study. Uh, this study also showed that um, workers had an increased odds of suffering from acute kidney injury with every five degrees Fahrenheit increase in the environmental temperature. With this first moist article from 2017, however, they utilized a calculated physiological strain index. So if you think back to those two different types of heat strain that I mentioned earlier, we've now moved from environmental heat strain to physiological or the metabolic demand that the body is placing on itself. Um, and this study found that approximately 12% of workers experienced acute kidney injury with workers who were being paid by the piece and females having a greater odds of developing acute kidney injury. So this piece rate and this piece rate is really important because workers who are paid by the piece are incentivized to work harder and to collect um, more crops from the field. And so whenever that piece rate is being employed, if they work harder and they collect more, they're then paid more. Um, you see this play out all the time. I was a part of the Moultrie Farm Worker Program that the school does. And you would see literally they're giving, the workers are given poker chips and that is what they bring in at the end of the day and they trade in their poker chips for their paychecks. Um, it's what goes into the ledger. And it would be a lot better in my mind if we all just started rallying around farm workers and saying we should pay for a living decent wage. Um, and this just provides one piece of the evidence saying that needs to happen. Um, again, the last quantitative study was the study by Moist from 2020. And this is the only study that looked at both environmental heat strain and physiological heat strain. Um, and in their sample, they found that approximately 15% of their workers suffered from acute kidney injury. And they found that workers with a higher three minute maximum workload, and, and again, being paid by the piece were associated with an increased odds of developing acute kidney injury. So again, we see that theme of the harder someone is working, the more likely they are to develop um, acute kidney injury. The qualitative ethnog um, ethnography that was included in this work um, was conducted by Sarah B. Horton. And in this work, she lived and worked alongside farm workers in California Central Valley for, about a, for a period of approximately 10 years. And while there was no formal assessment of heat strain that the workers um, that the workers were experiencing, she does provide a really good socioeconomical context and cultural context for why this heat strain piece is so important in the farm workers. She particularly, she mentions multiple times the machismo culture and how to be a man, you have to work hard and you can't stop to drink water. And it provided a really good study to contextualize the quantitative results and was why it was included as part of the scoping review. So now again, I will go through the discussion and this may be quick because I spent some more time in the results discussing things than I did whenever I first presented this PowerPoint. So please forgive me for anything that's repeated. 
So the scoping review provides additional evidence that climate change will negatively impact the health of outdoor workers and particularly farm workers in the United States. To contextualize this further, we can look at the work of Tiglachar in which they showed that by the middle of the century, our nation's agricultural communities will experience high heat extremes and multiple day heat events with either a two degree C or a four degrees Celsius rise in temperature. And so what do those numbers kind of re represent? That two degrees is if we do all we can to stop global admissions. Um, and that four degrees says if we're just going on our current trajectory. So no matter what we do, our farm workers are going to be at risk of suffering from high heat conditions at work. And so as you can imagine, this represents that perfect storm for future impacts of outdoor workers experiencing heat stress and then acute kidney injury and then down the road developing chronic kidney disease due to their working conditions. This review also provides evidence that we need standardized protocols between research groups. So if you think back to the three, the three calculations of environmental heat strain that were utilized by the three different studies. All three had different, different methods that they were using, even across from environmentally, they looked at two different measures and then physiologically, even the same research group used two different physiological measures to measure that physiological strain. Um, we also need longitudinal assessments of how working in the heat is impacting one's kidneys. So the longest study that was in this, the quantitative work, obviously the, the ethnography was done over 10 years, but of those quantitative pieces, the longest one was three days. And so we really need protocols that are now looking at overgrowing and harvest seasons, what are happening, and then also over multiple years, how are people's kidneys responding to working in the heat. And then one limitation of this review was that it only looked at the impact of occupational heat strain on kidney functioning and farm workers. And that's really kind of what led to the second piece of my dissertation is I wanted to know what other occupational groups could be susceptible to high heat conditions at work. And so what does all of this mean? So in Georgia, there is only emergent hemodialysis for undocumented immigrants. And if we're thinking about our farm workers that are developing kidney disease, in a lot of cases, they are undocumented. Um, additionally, if we're thinking about construction workers and landscapers, which is what we thought we would find in our sample, it's really interesting. Um, that was not all that we found, just goes to show how research can surprise you sometimes but they would also be more likely to be undocumented. So we knew that if we were trying to look in Georgia, at least because we have an expanded Medicaid, we would need a special program to capture the participants that we needed their, their occupational histories from. So we partnered with Grady Memorial Hospital, which is Atlanta's safety net hospital and has developed a pretty unique and special emergency dialysis program. So typically whenever someone receives emergent dialysis, they're only dialyzed every week to week and a half, that we really look at their potassium. And once their potassium comes, becomes so high that their heart could stop from an arrhythmia, that is when we decide, oh, this person needs emergent only, uh, needs emergent dialysis, so we should dialyze them in the emergency room. Grady, on the other hand, figured out that we can have better outcomes if we're dialyzing people regularly. And so whenever we look at not only the outcomes, if you're providing dialysis regularly, you're also improving uh, morbidity and mortality rates as well. And so they're able to use their EMTALA funds, which is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which provides funds for emergency care in whatever way they see fit. Um, it's how hospitals can use those funds. And so they decided it is cheaper for us to provide dialysis regularly than waiting on these people to show up at our door and say, we need care. And they're only getting their dialysis every week to week and a half because it's cheaper. The ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure kind of thing. We can prevent all of these morbidity and mortality things associated with decompensated kidney disease if we dialyze people more. So Grady Memorial's program is able to dialyze their undocumented immigrants two to three times a week, depending on the schedule and the availability of nurse practitioners and nurses. And so the, these workers know that they can show up to Grady, they check in at the ER, their labs are taken, and then they are admitted to the hospital for emergency dialysis, but they can get their emergent dialysis two to three times a week. So this is the first group that I took to Grady Hospital as part of this project. I knew being a white man, even though I spoke Spanish, that I would have to 
earn the trust of the, the doctors, the nurses, the patients on the floor at Grady. And so how it works is once they have checked in, once the, the undocumented immigrants have checked in at Grady, they are then all kind of told to wait. And then once the nurse practitioner and the nurse practitioner, Lauren, who helped with this project is on the right, once they arrive for the day, they're all then admitted under her care and taken to a waiting room on the dialysis unit. And so Lauren and I thought that it would be a good time while people are waiting on their dialysis to sit down and really do this occupational history study. And we found, even though we had this idea, we knew we needed to pilot it and show a proof of concept that this could work, that people would tell us about their occupational histories. And so we led these immersion trips through the School of Nursing to our local and safety net hospital and showed that people were willing to talk with us and they wanted to talk about their occupational history because there's always so many researchers who are trying to come in and be like what are you eating what are you doing how are you managing your kidney disease and so we were hesitant that they wouldn't want to talk to us but by having the students there, we were really able to figure out that yes, occupational exposures are something that people are willing to talk about, and they will sit down for a 30 to 45 minute survey with someone that does not look like them and talk about their work. So the overall study aims for this dissertation, this piece of my dissertation, were to characterize the specific occupational vulnerabilities that the persons receiving frequent emergent only hemodialysis had suffered in the past. And then we also wanted to help inform areas of prevention related to these occupational exposures. We wanted, um, even though our goal was to study maybe what occupational exposures may have led to their kidney disease, we also knew that we would undercover things that might help us lead prevention efforts in other areas. So that was one of the specific aims of the study. So our final sample, we were we recruited from Grady Memorial Hospital. We recruited specifically from this emergent dialysis unit, which has about 122 patients. It's constantly fluctuating as people move in and out of the Atlanta metro area, um, as people are able to get insured through the ACA, as the residency status changes. So it was guesstimated that at any given time where there was about 122 as the total sample. And then persons had to self-identify as um, Latino or Latinx, and we ended up with a final sample of 50. Our inclusion criteria included that they needed to be born outside of the United States. That was kind of how we were able to assess if someone was an undocumented immigrant or not without specifically asking, was if they had been born outside of the United States and this emergent dialysis unit was their primary mechanism of receiving care, we assumed that they were undocumented because if they were documented, then they could be covered under Medicare and Medicaid for their dialysis services. Um, and then also persons had to be over 18 years of age. Our exclusion criteria were a little broader and we did this to make this study match a parent study that was going on at the school at the time. So people were excluded if they had a history of esophageal stomach or intestinal disease, if they had a history of esophageal stomach or intestinal surgeries or cancers of these three areas, um, if they had swallowing difficulties, if they had a pacemaker were pregnant or they weighed less than 37 kilograms or 80 pounds. And we did not find anyone that we excluded for those reasons. Um, we approached about 70 people total. And then out of those 70 that we approached, we got that final 50 sample after the inclusion and exclusion criteria had been met. Um, and so we did this again to kind of facilitate that data comparison between that parent study that was going on because we asked a lot of the same questions in the surveys. Uh, the surveys were adopted from work that had been done with migrant farm workers in South Georgia and in Florida. So we really wanted to align our studies so that we could if eventually do a comparison. Our recruitment, we again recruited persons while they were waiting on their dialysis, and we had several measures to ensure that there was no coercion. The medical team was not involved in the recruitment, so I did not let doctors or nurses on the unit recruit patients for me. And then again, I had been spending time on the unit so that the patients knew my face, they trusted me, they knew me as someone that wasn't just going to come in, get their information, and then take it and run. And I was also in that time of piloting, I was able to. I was able to make connections with patients and their caregivers. And so there was particularly one, one child um, of a lady that we piloted the surveys with who was about my age. And you could tell she was very weary of why I was coming in. And it took me and her 
her mother sitting down, we were having a conversation and we were both sitting there looking and we stopped the survey and we paused and we watched this very attractive doctor walk down the hallway and we both realized what we had done and burst into laughter. And then this lady became one of my biggest advocates for getting people to, in, to participate in the study over this seemingly moment of this Latinx woman and this openly gay man sitting down and watching this doctor walk down the hallway. It's really funny. It was something that I'll, I'll always remember. Um, and then we also ensured that patients would be reassured that their dialysis treatment would not be inhibited by their willingness to participate in the survey or not. And if they participated, the survey could be done on the dialysis machine if necessary. Um, and this really wasn't a problem because the, the patients that were receiving dialysis um, through this emergent this emergent setting, they have to wait so long. We only had one or two that we ended up having to transition to the dialysis machine. And then we were able to, because of how it's dispersed out, there was one Spanish speaker in a room of three English speaking patients. So we were still able to have the conversation in Spanish. And we tried not to ask very sensitive questions that even if there was someone that spoke Spanish, so it wouldn't be an issue if we had to move to the machine or not. And then we also, again, use that snowball recruitment method, and this had worked well in the past with other studies that our team had done with farm workers and other undocumented workers, and it worked well here, too. So our my methodology, again, was really based off the Grady dialysis, dialysis questionnaire, and that questionnaire had been adapted from work that our team had done in both South Georgia and in Florida with migrant farm workers. For the Grady dialysis questionnaire, all I ran was descriptive statistics. So it was really what jobs have you had? What, what health conditions have you been diagnosed with? We weren't able to do a chart review as part of this process. That is one of the limitations. Um, so we had to go off of the self-reported health and occupational histories. We then used this occupational and environmental health history form. It was developed by the Pulmonology Association in San Diego and the Imperial counties. And it asks about what were your jobs? What industry were they in? Did you wear PPE? What specific exposures do you remember having in these jobs? And did you have any injuries? And this is where my dissertation had to get really creative is because I knew that we go from this Grady dialysis questionnaire, which are just surveys of did you work in this job, yes or no? How long were you in this job? That could be analyzed through descriptive statistics. This occupational environmental health history form, it took, it was all free text. And so I knew that I didn't have enough free text to do the, the analysis that is traditional of the qualitative world. And so I knew that I'd have to get creative. And so that's where I used natural language processing and did topic modeling, which is essentially principal component analysis of text, and then looking to see which themes or which components come out in the text. The first paper that came from this aim of the diss dissertation was the self-reported health histories and the socio-demographic characteristics of the population. Our results, um, our age, these people were very young, highlights that disparity of kidney disease, uh, the mean age being 45.9 years old. There was a pretty even split between identifying as male, identifying as female, and the majority were Mexican or Mexican American, and of course the majority spoke Spanish. Um, of course, another thing to highlight that I felt was important from this dissertation was the type of housing, particularly the high level that uh, reported renting their homes. Um, just knowing that we have gone through a COVID crisis, I was lucky enough to get this data collected before COVID, and the the increased risk that homelessness and um, chronic kidney disease have whenever the two are combined. So again, these are the main results and um, just shown in a different way. We'll highlight here the different health histories. So 80% of the sample had hypertension at the time of diagnosis. Um, only 12% reported ever having a heat stroke and then 14% or seven really lacked those traditional risk factors for developing chronic kidney disease. So what does all of this mean? So we have a younger age than what would be expected at time of diagnosis. Whenever we compare the age of this group 
to the national data. Uh, the national data shows that the initiation of dialysis treatment is 62 and a half years for all races and genders and 58.7 years for Latinx persons. And the average age of people receiving dialysis was 45. Um, we did not ask about their age at initiation of dialysis, um, but even though that they're receiving it and their mean age is 45, their initiation age was even lower if we had investigated that. Um, we also found that the majority live under the federal poverty line. And so nurses who are working with this population should be making prompt referrals to social work when appropriate. And again, that high percentage that rent their homes and we should be doing a strong housing assessment and again, making appropriate referrals. So that social worker and housing assessment, I'm sorry, it's been a while since I went through this PowerPoint. Uh, the third paper from my dissertation really focused on the occupational histories of this cohort. And again, it was the same demographic, so I won't present that slide again um, because it was based on the, the demographics of the same people. The main results were that 28% were currently working and 74% have worked in the past five years. And then only half of our sample reported using PPE at work. And again, this data was collected pre-COVID. So whenever we asked about PPE, we meant the PPE that keeps you safe at work. Um, we didn't ask like if you were wearing a PPE or a mask out because this data was collected pre-COVID. Our industries of interest were agricultural, construction, factory or processing plant, housekeeping or cleaning and landscaping. And these were the, the various different jobs that were reported. Um, it was really interesting that the majority reported a housekeeping or cleaning ever having worked in. And we found that after people had become sick, this is what they had transitioned to, were working as either housekeepers or cleaners. Um, and before they got sick, they were really working in the agricultural construction factory processing world. This is a word cloud of the responses to the question, are there known health hazards in the workplace? This one is really interesting to me because the bigger the word, the more often it came up. And the biggest word here is none. So in this, in this group of people, the, they thought that there were no hazards at the workplace. It was the most common thing we heard. And then the second most common were chemicals. So heat wasn't even on their radar as being an occupational exposure that could harm them. Now on to my meat and potatoes of this paper. So again, this is topic modeling. It is a form of natural language processing in which those underlying themes and text data are identified. And to do so, you create a limitized corpus, and that's why some of these words look a little funny. And that limitization process ensures that all words are taken from their various parts of speech and shortened to their stem. So for example, you have construct as the first word on the top right, top left, and that could be construction, constructed, constructing. At their, at their stem, at their base, they all mean the same thing. So that limitization process um, gets rid of any variation that may stem from the various parts of speech. We also remove stop words during the preparation of a corpus, and those stop words are words, words such as a, an, or the that really don't have any contextual meaning to what is going on. And then again, like I said, in order to identify those topics, you do principal component analysis on your corpus once it has been limitized, and then any components are then identified as themes. And we whenever we first ran this corpus, how you go through is you look, just like you would with principal component analysis, you look for clustering. And we found that our themes, out of all of the possible themes, they appeared to be clustered into two groups. And so we re-ran our model with a K of two, which is just topic modeling speak for an N of two. And these were the two that we found. The one on the left was titled outdoor work and the one on the right we named as indoor work so we were really able to tease out those groups of workers based on what they reported as to if they had worked inside or outside and you really see this is important so we went through and we wanted to make sure that this this algorithm had worked and whenever you see words such as construct construct is in both the indoor and the outdoor 
uh, topics. And we found that whenever we went back and we were listening to people, there were lots of people that talked about cleaning up in a construction site after the homes were built. And so that being able to the model, the algorithm's ability to pick up on those subtle variations also allowed us to know that we think what we found is truly there in the data, these two topics. So what does all of this mean? Um, we have slightly higher levels of employment in the sample than compared to the national data. Uh, the national data only reports that about 23% of people on dialysis are currently employed, whereas we had 28% in our study. Um, it also showed that clinicians working with this population should be emphasizing the importance of personal protective equipment at work for protecting yourself while you're working, um, whatever it may be, harnesses, gloves, goggles, so on and so forth, because again, we only found that about half of our sample was using PPE at work. Um, we also should be taking a thorough occupational history with those that are receiving frequent emergent only hemodialysis, just because there are so many different variables that could be impacting someone's health by having them at our disposal, we can really start to tease out what might be causing from work the, their kidneys to fail. We also need to start doing studies with indoor and outdoor workers. We always think about our outdoor workers as being exposed to heat. Um, however, whenever we went back and we looked at the indoor workers, a lot of our indoor workers that worked, particularly in dry cleaners, they reported high heat conditions at work. So we should remember our indoor workers whenever we are trying to conduct these studies and looking at occupational heat exposure. Now together, what does all of this mean? So whenever we integrate the results of the two studies, we find that 14% or seven out of 50 had lacked those traditional risk factors for developing chronic kidney disease. And then those seven had all worked as either landscapers or construction workers. And so this kind of highlights the, the difference in between our rural farm workers who are known to be at risk for suffering from acute kidney injury at work and possibly developing CKDU. But now we need to do studies in urban areas that will highlight um, the impact of heat on urban workers. The limitations is that this dissertation was cross-sectional, so we causality cannot be inferred. Um, we may have introduced recall bias by relying on those self-reported health and occupational histories. Again, we weren't able to verify the health histories through the chart review. There are some questions around the generalizability of the study, given just how unique this emergency dialysis facility is. Um, we weren't able to do that chart review, which didn't, again, uh, even though with the, the recall bias, we weren't able to look at lab values and kidney biopsies that might help confirm if some those seven people that didn't have traditional risk factors had the lab markers and the biopsies that we typically see in the CKDU population. And then again, there was no comparison. We didn't have healthy controls that we could compare the occupational histories to. So what are my next steps? Um, obviously, there is a need to know what is happening at construction workers and landscapers and even thinking about those indoor workers. Um, there might be a need for a case control study to really tease out over time what are the occupational differences in undocumented immigrants that have developed chronic kidney disease and those that haven't developed chronic kidney disease. Um, I personally would like to move into the world of studying heat waves and kidney dysfunction. So do we have more hospitalizations do, um, during times of heat waves, um, and particularly within cities, are areas that are known to be urban heat islands, do more people have kidney dysfunction from those areas, really getting into geocoding. I would also like to continue my clinical work with migrant farm workers. As you can see on the left um, is a picture of us from the fields in Moultrie this past June. It was about 12 a.m. when we wrapped up night camp um, where we set clinic up for the farm workers and I went as an NP student. And then my next steps will be to start an assistant professorship. So I'm really excited to see some of my Villanova colleagues here today. So thank you all. Here are my references. I'll stop sharing my screen.